Hello there, YouTubers, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Cassette's Workshop. What we have right here is a little stereo amplifier that I'm working on. One of the channels is not finished yet, the other one is all ready and working. I have one right there, obviously. This is using a pair of TDA2052 integrated amplifier chips. They're kind of like the TDA2030A except they add a completely useless standby feature for microprocessor controlled stereo systems which uh, basically means that you have to feed another 5 volts into the chip in order to get it to turn on that's kind of an annoyance I solved the problem by putting in a little voltage divider, two extra resistors and uh, that's that Anyway, as you can see, this is all connected up, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the output power of this thing. We're going to take some measurements and see how it, see how it all works, and then we're going to take a look at the data sheet and see if what we have right here matches up with the theory that's all written up in there. So, how does it all work? Well, let's go from the beginning of everything, and the beginning of course is always a power supply. Ignore this part of it, it's not hooked up. What we have right here is a toroidal power supply, goes into a rectifier bridge down there, and into a pair of smoothing capacitors, four of them. It does look kind of small, but uh, we are dealing with rather low voltages, so those caps are having quite a high capacity. Well, we can take a, a little voltage reading right here. There we go. So you can see we're having, well, 18 and a half volts on both rails, of course. It's a symmetric supply. That goes over into here. The input comes from this, from this one right here. This is a uh, Grundig uh, sine wave generator, and I have it adjust it so that it'll output a 1 kilohertz test tone at a variable amplitude. Then the output of the amplifier goes not into a speaker. It goes into a resistor. <laughs> I know this is kind of a funny construction. These are 10 82 ohm resistors, 1 watts hooked up in parallel to give me an 8.2 ohm resistor with uh, 10 watts. And um, I measured this. I took a precision measurements measurement on the, the upper one right there, which has a uh, low ohm range. And turns out this is precisely 8.12 ohms. You don't want to use a speaker for this all, because it'll have a non-linear impedance, um, and that is going to add distortion, and uh, you don't want that. It's going to take a, uh, a negative influence on uh, your measurements. So, that's that. That is our load. Hooked up in parallel, we have good old oscilloscope. You're going to see what that is good for in just a minute. And also, voltmeter. This is a precision voltmeter right there. Uh, both of these are, uh, and they will do true RMS AC measurements, and that's important. Anyway, uh, so what we do is, at the moment, this thing's turned off, so I'll turn it on, and we turn up the uh, amplitude on the frequency generator as you can see that also goes up on the output and by the way uh, of course that's our load resistor we do have voltmeter and oscilloscope hooked up in parallel but that doesn't matter because both of those are having an internal resistance of a mega ohm so you know in the end this is the only thing that's going to matter or 8.12 ohm resistor. So, uh, as you can see, we're getting a nice clean sine wave, and if we turn it up higher, you can see that. 
Ouch! That's no good. That is called clipping. When the output signal hits the uh, hits the um, input voltage, you know. So basically, we're having you know minus 18 and a half volts right here, plus 18 and a half volts right there. You see that on the scope. Anyway, uh, we obviously don't want that. What we want to do. We want to go right up to the point at which this clipping starts. So, right around there. Can take a bit of a closer look at that. Yep, right about there. Right about there. Okay, and now go ahead and take a look at our true RMS voltmeter. 11.3 volts, as you can see. And now we turn this all down again because uh, our load resistor starts to uh, smell a bit funky. And here comes the theory. Don't worry, it's all very, very easy. What we have right here, now these are all my results from uh, last night's experiments where I didn't have a camera with me. What we have our output voltage. Now we just got 11.3 volts. Yesterday I got 11.42 volts RMS, of course. Good old Ohm's law. That's what we need right now. Current is voltage divided by resistance. So put our true RMS voltage reading into there. That's of course our load resistor, 8.12 ohms. That gives us a current of 1.4064 amps. That's quite a lot for such a small little chip. You always got to keep that in mind. Our power equals voltage times current, and that gives us 16.06 watts. That is our output power. Continuous output power, RMS power, whatever you want to call it. Here we have the data sheet for the TDA, or is it TDA 2052, and here we have output power, of course, uh, continuous RMS, should be all able to read that, if not, switch to high definition. If we just go ahead and uh, take a look, they measured this all using the test circuit that is pretty much identical with the one that we've built. The GV, I don't think that matters for what we've been doing. Supply voltage plus minus 18 volts, we've been having 18 and a half volts, so that's close enough. Frequency, 1 kilohertz, ambient temperature, 25 degrees. Of course, we're all meeting those requirements, so we can compare what uh, we've just done to what they say in the data sheet. And down here, load 8 ohms, that's close enough to the 8.12 that we've had. We go over here, 22 watts. Oops, that's quite a bit higher. So, have we been doing something wrong? No, absolutely not. We've uh, just uh, not taken care or We've just not uh, realized that right there. Total harmonic distortion, 10%. Now what we've just done by adjusting our sine wave so that it does not clip is we've been optimizing our total harmonic distortion down to zero. So we have to look right there. 1%. That's more like it. That uh, should be pretty close to what we've done. So, once again, load 8 ohms, 17 watts. Yep, there it is, 17 watts. That's what uh, the guys at uh, SGS Thompson measured. We've been measuring 16.06 watts. I'd say that's close enough. Did a little bit of calculating, as it turns out. We're off by minus 5.53%, so that's relatively low. Pretty good. So, 16.06 watts. Now, we look at the front page. 
Big disappointment. What does it say right there? 60 watts hi-fi audio power amplifier. So that's quite a huge difference. So, have we done something wrong? Nope. SGS Thompson is just playing a bunch of fancy tricks on us to make their product look better. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, take a look at <clears throat> all that. Where are our 60 watts in this? Can you find them? Maybe not. They're right there. 60 watts. Typical. Now, you can already see that, I think, is a little bit suspicious. Minimum, 50 watts. Typical, 60 watts. No maximum. So, I have a feeling if they were completely honest with us, they'd have to put the 60 watts into the maximum, and then the typical would be 55 watts or something like that. Of course, that would not look that great on the front page. 55 watts hi-fi amplifier. No. Make that 60 watts looks better. But what is that? Well, we go over here. Music output power. Well, they are at least giving us a um, an IEC um, rule. So uh, it's not completely fantasy. But, uh, well, basically it's, it's getting there. These, you know, music output power or peak power output or PMPO or whatever. Those are all those more or less fantasy ratings that all the Chinese, preferably Chinese, but everybody else does it too, all those producers are giving you and that's how a flimsy tiny little boombox that's probably not even capable of putting out half a watt of RMS power suddenly gets a 100 watt per channel power output rating. That's how that is done, so never trust those music output power things. We take a look at how they did it. Supply voltage, plus minus 22.5. Of course, all the other readings, they used 18 volts. And even down here, for uh, a higher supply voltage, they only used 22 volts. Now, 25 volts is the absolute maximum that you're allowed to put into the chip, so they are pushing it quite a bit. Load resistance, 4 ohms. Of course, you want to go with the lowest load resistance possible, and that is, of course, 4 ohms for this chip. It won't do anything with uh, 2 ohms. It'll just be overloaded. Once again, total harmonic distortion, 10%. That's quite a bit of uh, distortion. You don't really want to listen to that. And then comes the most suspicious part to me, over one second. So, the question is, what happens? What happens? Is the chip going to turn off and go into protection mode after a second? Or is it even going to blow up or something? That's, that is a part that I really don't trust. There are measurements, um, measurement procedures for this kind of stuff where they go with just a nanosecond, you know? And of course, over a nanosecond, you're going to be able to get 600 watts or something like that. So that's, yeah, that's the suspicious part. And, uh, yeah, that's how they got the 60 watts that uh, they put onto the front page. Here is another thing to uh, think about. This is a fairly modern design, TDA. 2052. If we just go ahead and compare it to the good old TDA 2030A, which has been around since the 1970s, I just look at the. Uh, I can just find the front page of this. The TDA 2030A is an 18 watts hi fi amplifier and 35 watt driver, but that doesn't matter. 18 watts. So, is that technical progress, the 2052 puts out 60 watts, this one only 18 watts. Well, let's take a look. Electrical characteristics and we just go ahead. Output power, total harmonic distortion, even lower than uh, on that other chip, just half a percent.
we are getting for 8 ohms and uh, well 19 volts of uh, supply voltage that's close enough to 18 and a half 19 volts 8 ohms BAM 16 watts typical RMS output power as you can see they are just saying output power because back then they just they just didn't thought it was necessary to have some some fantasy measurements some bullshit measurements music power so 16 watts this one 17 watts wherever it may be in this table so there you go that is what they call technical progress <laughs> think about that one and one last thing I would like to point out to you so you can see I have this uh, load resistor soldered straight into the circuit using these uh, relatively decent wire. In a previous attempt, in a previous experiment, I used some very, very flimsy alligator clip leads. These things right here. And um, so you can see that's what uh, the upper part is all about. And as you can see, we got 11.42 volts or uh, something around there. Previously, I got only 10.4 volts. So, by using these flimsy cheap um, alligator clip leads, and those were actually getting quite warm whenever uh, I had the whole thing powered up and under, under load. These flimsy things, we can uh, just take a look at that. This is of course the precision O meter. We just put that in there. One of these flimsy cheap little alligator clip leads, these flimsy things, 0 0.689 ohms. So we go to the resistor and back we're having over an ohm of additional resistance. So here is the consequence. We've only been getting 13 watts. So 3 watts of power loss just because of some flimsy cheap speaker cables. And of course that is also going to apply to your stereo system. So, to hook up speakers, use some decent wire. So, that's about it. Analyzing the output power capabilities of the TDA 2052 integrated amplifier chip. Well, I hope you learned something. Hope this video was useful to someone. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.